Okay, everybody's taken their test and turned it in. Yes, good. All right, they will be tallied. So I these are the these are the people that give me money. My actual conflicts of interest have to do much more with my synagogue, my politics, my family. But these are the people that I get money from. So thank you, people. Um, and I don't let them influence me, but there they are. Okay, this is the itinerary for the talk. This is the terrain we're going to walk on. Biomethics has two tasks, of course, a descriptive task and a normative task. And as you see, I'm going to spend most of my time thinking about descriptive tasks. Um, as you see here, we'll walk your way through it. And then I'm going to, because I'm the kind of ethicist that likes telling people what to do, I'm going to then talk about normative judgments and figure out what we should do about the puzzles that we've presented. Fair enough? Yes, questions on itinerary, you're on it? Tickets on the train, we're good to go. All right, first the description. We live, do I even need to say this, this thing, in one of the most fraught, vexed political moments in our history of America. We are right in the middle of history. There is no escaping from this increasingly fraught political terrain. We face a polarized country in a deeply polarized time. And interestingly enough for bioethics, the body is the terrain of liberty. When we think about liberty, we used to think about Holy Roman Empire, just war theory, statecraft, right? Voting rights, civil rights. I came of age, many of you came of age, thinking about civil rights in the Vietnam War. Now we think about the body as the smaller but intensely felt terrain of liberty, the moral status of the human embryo, gender, um, gender affirmation interventions, yes or no, End of life decision making. Are we dead or are we not dead? Reproductive rights, of course, epidemiology, vaccination, all of the terrain of the body. The fight is about the liberty of the body. And both signs, caring signs, of course, saying my body, my choice on different sides of things. So, given that, it might seem as if bioethicists should take a stand on things because, after all, the body, that's your job, right? Taking care of the body. So it does, it's extremely tempting to think about liberty in terms of your area of expertise. This week, there are wars in Eastern Europe, there are wars in the Middle East. There is a crisis in the climate that's affecting millions. Just today, Spain is now inundated by floods. A great deal of Western North Carolina still doesn't have power and devastating tragedies there. One can even mention Florida, which is always flooded. Um, we are in the middle of a very bitter national debate where the guardrails have gone off and apparently it's perfectly okay to swear in public now. So there you go. And there's an election next week about what it means to be in the demos, about democracy itself, in which speech and what we say and the rhetoric of our speech is really at stake. And if you're not worried, if you're not concerned about what the next week will bring, I was thinking like we're not having a talk next Wednesday because what, we're planning on what, sitting Shiva or what, what the story is. <laughs> like, it's a very, it's a time of extraordinary anxiety in which it might seem like each of us have an, has an obligation to do something, to be somewhere within that debate. How should we think about this? Well, let me first say we can turn to history and give you a quick review of this debate in bioethics. First of all, bioethics has had a very long standing debate about this. It was called the taking positions debate. It was not a debate about stances, but it's taking positions. Should we take a position? In 2001, when immodestly enough, I was president of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities, I published and gave a speech and published a, an article called A Just Bioethics in an Unjust World. It called for ASPH to take positions on issues that affected either patients or our field. And as president, I set up three task forces in ASBH our academic association. One was for healthcare policy. 
this is pre Obamacare, so there was no there was no universal health care at all. Um, one was for credentialing the field, and one was for how we should take payment from for profit entities, right? And I got fierce opposition from my beloved teacher, Tristan Engelhart, um, who is Anna Illis's uh, teacher as well, who said, that is ridiculous. It's not the Democratic Party, it's ASBH. And many people said, no, we shouldn't be taking positions. And then classically, Alta Charo, our Kaplan, Jonathan Moreno said, no, we should take positions because these are issues of our time, universal health care, that call for us to have a stand. We must take a stand, a political stand. And that debate went on very fiercely for quite a long time. Um, there were critics, the debate was so fierce, it, it, it involved critics outside the field. Um, Sally Sattel in 2010, writing from the Hoover Institute said, you bioethicists, what difference does it make that you take a stand? When bioethicists speak, who listens? When geologists weigh in on global warming, attention must be paid. After all, they're experts in climate science. But when bio, a bioethicist put out a full page ad, which we did in the New York Times, urging the passage of universal health care, which me and all my people on the progressive side all happily signed, as we did in 1994, what kind of expertise do they bring to bear? And Sattel said there are two issues at stake. First, the moral discernment is commonly available to all. So what does it mean to say you're an expert in ethics? Right? Because everybody should be ethical. I am ethical. I'm a doctor. I'm ethical. I hear all the time. And like, well, Professor Brudney and I cringe whenever we hear that. Like, no, it's years of study. Um, Sattel said, and no, and like, who cares? What, what does it even mean to have a profession of bioethics? It's ridiculous. And her second issue was our positions in bioethics are unfailingly left wing positions. Like, no one challenges it. There's nothing. Just saying, a heart would occasionally say, no, and brought a gun to meetings and stuff. But, you know, other than Tris, it was really rare. Griffin Trotter, too, would, would do that occasionally. Um, it was like a left-wing consensus about what seemed com like commonly true for all of us. And there were debates primarily focused, and here's a United University of Chicago, and on Leon Cast, microbiologist and somebody who was working as a bioethicist at the time, and President Bush's um, Presidential Commission on Bioethics, which was the the great great grandchild of the Belmont Commission was a presidential commission on bioethics. And the presidential commission was the locus of much of our debates. Cass, of course, Cass Commission um, was quite conservative, leaned very much to the right. And that developed. Um, it was, it was, in fact, Alta Charo called this the endarkening of bioethics. Um, and progressive bioethics began to fight with that, and there was quite big fights with placards and signs at our organizations and organizations, should we take stands and what should the stands be? And we actually did take positions on both sides of the spectrum. We had positions on stem cell research. We had positions on end of life care, on cloning, on IVF and on AIDS. There was a lot of positions that were taken. And there were two th streams that developed that. This is of course Sattel's book, PCMD, how political correctness is corrupting medicine. In it, it's not just medicine, she takes, she takes AIM at bioethics taking positions. And this is the progress, progress in bioethics. Again, disclosure, I'm in this book arguing for, for um, justice in healthcare. And this, um, this is Moreno and, and Sam Berger's book. It was a, a, a bunch of people putting together why we should take positions on science and policy and politics, right? So the debate's longstanding, this was the 2000s. And why, what's going on? So, that's the practice. That's what happened. That's the history. Now the interesting part for philosopher, which is the theory. So let's turn to philosophy. So what is our theory? Why should or should you speak? And why is this not showing up on this? Thing? Well, interesting. Why should or should you speak? Um, okay. So the theory really begins for me in thinking about Hannah Arendt. And thinking about Hannah Arendt's idea of what it meant to be a citizen and what it meant to be a human in dark times. Now, Hannah Arendt, no stranger to dark times, I'm sure she too thought her, obviously her democracy was at stake. She thinks about the Greek polis. What does it mean to be a Greek? How did the Greeks think about the structure of human life? And for Arendt, she puts forward that there are two realms of human life, the public and the private. 
And these realms are important in the private life are, is the family, hierarchical relationships between the head of the household, the, the father in, in almost every case, um, nature, relationships of nature that are naturally acquired, ideas about nature, ideas about personal identity. Your personal identity matters in the realm of private rights. You do labor and you do work. Two different things for a rent. Labor is the business of the ordinary production of uh, human activity, making the bed, feeding the children, whatever. Work is the actual construction, the fashioning of things. And she said, all of that takes place where your individuality, your who you are, your biology, your individuality, your class, your race, your gender, all of that matter in a hierarchically organized and arranged. But there's another arena of human life called the public. And for her, Arendt, the public is where the Greeks would leave all of that behind and go into civic life and be citizens. And that is the place where there's not labor or work, which she thinks are not all that interesting, but action, moral action. And for her, the via activa, this notion of an active life is what makes us human. That is where we find humanity itself, not in the private realm, but in the public realm where we are equal, we are citizens, right? Is it rent? My heroes, right? Um, and in this realm, the public realm, we stand there as completely equals where our identity does not matter. There is no standpoint epistemology for her. That's in the private realm. The public realm, it doesn't matter. And only there are we completely equal as citizens. And only there can we speak as citizens. And she calls this what's the space of appearance. And the space of appearance, the fulcrum of her ideas about this, it's created a physical space, but also an intellectual space by robust discourse by citizens who stand in the civic space without identity, defined only by their arguments and only in that sense, they're completely equal. And this for her is called plurality. It's the only way to get to truth, parhesia. You debate it, you argue about it. And this is the plurality within her democratic polis. Parhesia is the central moral action in the demos. Speaking truth is the action of the free citizen. And that is where humanity is. And the crushing of that for her was the sin of, the, of Nazism because in fact, it was crushed. There was no, when you degrade the space, space of appearance, right? You just don't have democracy. You don't have a space of appearance. Now, of course, what's happening in our time is we have the space of appearance everywhere, but um, in a sense, it's different if the space of appearance looks like this versus TikTok, right? And here, only your argument matters. Now, of course, your male argument argues. Plato did think that women could be in the Republic of two and could be philosopher kings as well. But the reality was this is what mattered. And the crafting of the argument and the rhetoric and the language was fundamentally important for free citizens. Now, that's one idea, one theory. Another theory is the university. We work within a university. And because we work within a university, it's a little different. It's not the Parthenon, it's different. Academic medicine is peculiar because it's both within the university and within the profession of medicine. Two different spheres of arenas. So let's start with the university. What is the university? So the model for Arendt is the Socratic dialogue and the mission of transmission from professor to student, a relationship of power, by the way, based on rationality, based on transmission of traditions, different perspectives within disciplinary norms and civility. Now notice that perspectives within disciplinary norms, there are disciplinary norms that do the adjudication of what is permissible speech, right? And it's civil and it's rational, right? We live within a community in the university shaped by these ideas of free inquiry and the rational expression of competing ideas. That's the point of being in a university as opposed to being, you know, someplace else. The physical space of the university is an intellectual space of ideas as well. And this notion of transmission assumes something really interesting about tradition itself. Right? I'll, get, I'll return to this. The idea of medicine that is overlaid 
And it's like the university. A university is a sign, in the semiotic sense, a sign that's a cluster of other moral actions. We say the university, we mean a bunch of moral actions. And we say the clinic or medicine is another such sign that stands in for a lot of other activities. The teaching and the training of doctors bears very special responsibilities that are really, they're different from me teaching people divinity undergraduates or me teaching Renana how to be a PhD. These are different than teaching a doctor how to be a doctor, right? This all takes place within very specific relationships of power and tradition and meaning that accrue to medicine that do accrue differently to law or to business or other professions. Now, this means that there's a concept of what we call role-specific duties. Physicians have role-specific duties that are separate from their duties as citizens. And these obligations are based in correlative relationships between duties and rights. So there's no freestanding rights without a corresponding duty to provide that right. And they take place within the private sphere, not the public sphere. For rent, this is a private sphere negotiation. Now, why? Now, if you've been listening, you understand. Well, because it's private, for one, it's not public, because it's a relationship between physician and patient, because there's power relationships, because there's authority, and because identity does matter, and the natural world does matter, and families do matter, and race and class and epistemic stands do matter, and personal values do matter, and faith does matter, all of those for a rent are private sphere kind of obligations. And that's where it takes place. And you believe this too, or we wouldn't be so upset about Roe v. Wade, because the reason that the that um, the Supreme Court in Roe found for the state to be able to set up a structure and permissibility of abortion is because we said, even though there's no privacy rights in the constitution, there's a penundra of rights that imply privacy. And that privacy right, that decisions between doctor and patient are private and special, and we don't want the state to come into them, is the whole basis of our withdrawal of care, of our care of newborns, our care of abortion, all of the reproductive rights, all of that assumes the same thing that a rent is theorized, which is these are private. These are not civic negotiations. So labor and work take place there and hierarchy and privacy characterize this relationship between the physician and the patient in medicine. And that is why these you have role specific duties that are different from your duties as a citizen. Now, and all of this, by the way, takes place with principles, assumptions of liberal democracy that surround both academic medicine, medicine, and the university. All liberal theories share in common the presuppositions of the classic liberal tradition. They rest on the assurance of the primacy of the individual. The individual person has liberty and rights and duties and the ability to engage in voluntary consent. And that exists prior to any social contract that we would choose to be a part of. The social contract that's entered into by rational free agents, such as all of us, operates from an original position that was either historical or hypothetical, but this decision creates a liberal state and all of our institutions. Okay, but here we are at the University of Chicago. Dr. Hippocrates, meet Professor Calvin. So what's the Calvin Report say about all this? The Calvin Report promises something interesting. It promises neutral academic space for what can be very fierce academic discourses. And if you've never been given a talk at the University of Chicago, all of you have, because you'll have jobs, presumably, or will have jobs, um, God willing, um, the debate can be fierce, right? And should be fierce, because we have academic arguments that are real. And the Cal Report promises those are protected. It allows for individual professors also, not only to speak within their disciplinary realm, but to speak in the public realm as citizens when they're not at the university being professors, they can go out just like the Greeks did to the civic realm and be citizens and say whatever they want and they can't be punished. They ought not be punished for that within the neutral space of the university. The civic space, however, that has subject to the first amendment, the state, all of that stuff, 
is not the same as the university. It wasn't the same for Plato. It's not the same for Arendt. And it's certainly not for Calvin. We, it doesn't apply here. We're a different, we're a different entity and therefore our speech is different. Now, second big point besides public and private that I want you to remember is the dangers of the, of the confusion in our time historically between experts and authority, expertise and authority. Now there's a lot of reasons for this confusion. And as a professor of religion, <laughs> we always have this slight chip on our soldier. Like remember the golden days when there were just priests and they took us seriously and we had all the authorities. We theologians, people listened. We had prophecy, whatever. We had prophecy, we had power, we had empires and now we lost it. And now we have all these scientists taking them. Yeah, we say this a lot, but it's really true, right? And philosophers make the, have the same we, this, we, they, they, they have the same whining that we do. Um, and the reason for this confusion is profound is because science is so good. Medicine and science is so powerful and so good. So it won as a source of truth. It won as a source of meaning. It won as a source of prophecy. You want to know what's going to happen to you, right? You don't go see the witch of Endor or the soothsayer or your rabbi or your priest to think about. You go to your doctor. Right, and your doctor knows, and your scientist knows, and that's that 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 very powerful prophetic capacity that was always a part of moral authority is held by science and medicine, and not really religion, right? Even though religion, by the way, seventy six percent of all Americans really believe. We will tell pollsters at least that they go they go to a religious organization or participate in something religious once a week. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but they do tell. They do say that, and that's really durable. It's a durable number, right? 30, 30 to 40 percent of Americans, depending on what's tradition you're in, say that religion is the single most important force in their lives, right? 38 percent of Americans believe that there are actual angels in the world walking around shaping events. So we are a religious country, but yet science has really been the source of secular and state meaning for a very long time now, for generations. This means that there's a shift of that discourse, as I said before, from issues of terrain and statecraft to the terrain of the body, in large part because the physical body is the your job, right? Science and medicine's job, and not religion's job, which is always classically, the, the, the court made that deal long ago. Okay, church, you can have the soul, I'm taking the body. It's also true that we're confused between experts and authorities because of a widely disseminated media landscape. It used to be that there was a few papers of record, a few authoritative sources. You could believe what was published in science was true. What Dan Ariely's paper was like, that was a real thing. And now it's like, because of data collata, which has questioned so much of science, people know about data collata, that's another talk. But yes, people can now go and check and replication crisis is very real. Um, and we get our truth from all sorts of places, right? all sorts of expertise, all sorts of truth. And I'm sure if you're a physician, you've had someone come into your office to say, I've done the research. I've done the research. I've spoken to Rabbi Internet or Iman Internet, and they have told me. So it's more com complicated than a simple yes and no. And of course, COVID changed this, this tension between someone who's an expert in their field and knows about their field, their molecular biology, their liver function, and someone who has moral authority. And this shift between expertise and authority is complex and it's troubling, but it does give you the sense, physicians, that you can generalize your expertise, right? And we see this all the time. <laughs> speaking as a, speaking as a Jew, speaking as a physician, speaking as a bioethicist, speaking as a, and this as if to say my epistemic stance and let's remember my private epidemic stance for a rent, my private realm stance gives me the authority. I'm getting my authority from my expertise. And it's a confusion of this expertise and authority claim. But remember, expertise should not be generalized from one field to another. Okay, now let me just say, what's the, do we have the numbers on the case? We do. And? So uh, 19 people said yes to both questions, 14 said yes to the first question and no to the second question, eight said no to both, 
and one who said no to the first question and yes to the second. Okay. What did you just do, room of people, experts? Anyone have any idea? Did eight of did eight, the eight of you who said no? I didn't want to bother why you said no. Okay, let me tell you why you should have said no, why everybody should have said no. Because the case I just described of the disabled children who had been largely kept at home in their religious families and not allowed to see doctors and were discovered in the thing was the case of the T4 program in the um, by the Nazi party. Um, these are the happy doctors and nurses celebrating at the euthanasia centers. And these are some of the children that were disabled or, or Jewish or gypsy or children of communists who were decided to be taken in by the physicians in the National Socialist Physicians League because at the time in America and certainly in Germany, the proper socialist politically correct position was that disabled children were drained and should be sterilized. And since once they were sterilized in a drain in conditions of scarcity in a war, they should be eliminated. First, one by one, using what was said to be um, euthanasia, good euthanasia techniques, IV solutions. And then they developed these trucks, which they're being helped into now in this picture by doctors and nurses, hats, um, to be gassed using Zyklon B, a gas, by the way, developed by Fritz Haber's lab, um, who won the Nobel Prize, not for that, but for but for the Haber-Bosch process, and who refused to use the gas um, to gas Jews and um, fled Germany so he wouldn't use it. The gas was then used, all tested and all tried by physicians. These physicians, these physicians um, were very successful in the T4 program to eliminate disabled children. And the Catholic Church tried to oppose it and the Catholic Church was defeated in this. And the same people, because they were so skilled and so efficient, literally were the crew that went on to Buchenwald and Auschwitz, all of which was run by physicians, every bit of it. Initially, it's a public health idea. And by the way, the idea of euthanasia as public health was widely embraced by Emma Goldman and by Rosa Luxemburg and many people, many progressive people, in the 1920s and 30s who thought euthanasia was a really good idea um, for disabled children as a way to have a eugenic, a healthier, a healthier society. Okay, so given all that horror, um, given how badly we can be wrong, given how you can be easily led to be wrong, and the National Socialist Physicians League were social, people were socialists. 86% of all physicians in Germany joined that league and ran again the apparatus of the German state, ran the surveys, ran the genetic surveys, and did that because they thought they were doing public health. They really, they weren't trying to do evil, they were trying to do public health. And they believed they should take a stand for public health and their university should take a stand for public health, and they did. So what do we do now, us here? Well, I wanna draw a distinction between being a citizen and being a scholar. I think we need to act as citizens in the public arena, especially this week. We need to be as citizens in the public arena and speak. It is horrifying to think that people are already afraid to speak. And we've seen that with the endorsements of two prominent newspapers that used to endorse and now decided they're gonna be neutral. So neutrality doesn't work in the public arena. It's a profoundly bad idea, right? You have to be a part of history as a citizen, right? But in the university, you have to be a scholar and you have to make sure that you understand the difference. That's the first thing, the first role specific duty you have to be a scholar. It is an enormous responsibility and a privilege. Don't ever, big question when you hear someone say, speaking as a doctor, speaking as a this or as a that, don't do that. Stick to your knitting, as they say at NASA, stick to your lane. You're an expert in what you're an expert in, what you've been trained in. If you haven't, frankly, if you haven't been trained in the history of moral philosophy, don't opine on it because you're not an expert in it. You can have like a set of opinions, 
but these are skilled training. I don't know much about molecular biology. I have to listen. So listen, don't generalize your expertise, stick to your knitting, stick what you really know about. Beware of the slip into authority from your field of expertise. Be aware of the expertise authority problem. Be alert for errors of fact, right? The Catholic church was right. <laughs> the socialist physicians league was wrong, right? That had to be figured out. The state of genetics at the time in 1938 was pretty primitive and, and, and wrong, right? They thought incorrigibility was inherited, um, right? So be alert for errors of fact. The facts that you need to find out, that you need to know. Don't get swept away into thinking you know things that you don't know, right? Remember the deep vulnerability of your patients. Remember that patients are uniquely vulnerable or they wouldn't be here. They do not want to be here. They do not want to be in your office. They don't want to be looking at your white coat with little you know, slogans on it. They don't even want to be here. They're not your friend. You don't, they don't really want to, they don't really care about your individual political positions. They just want to not die. That's the basic bet, right? You can make two sorts of critiques of people. Remember this as well. We can say, that people are being bad scholars. And we're really good at that at the University of Chicago. Like, that's a bad argument, right? That's bad scholarship. And don't forget to critique bad scholarship. Don't be afraid to critique bad scholarship because it's embarrassing or politically correct or not correct. It's, it's bad scholarship. That's your whole job, right? And you can also critique distasteful speech or worse, hate speech. You can call something out. Did someone have the right to say something outrageous and hateful? Yeah, they theoretically they can. They can violate all sorts of norms. We saw that in Madison Square Garden, right? But you can critique it. That's your power. Your power is judgment. And one of the beautiful things of Hannah, Hannah Rant is she kept saying, do not be afraid to judge. Don't stand by. You have to judge. And you can judge both bad scholarship and distasteful or worse speech. The freedom to speak and the freedom to judge speech are the critical skills of the academy. And we really need to protect both to have, a, to have a university. Unless we're protecting both, we're not having a university. So our and the great enemy is, of course, is silence. We have the classic, beautiful picture of Socrates, the theorized Socrates here teaching his students all sorts of hierarchies and all sorts of differences in the academy. One of the things we have to also be, as a normative claim, is disinterested. And it's funny because normally I think my students always say, no, I want to be passionately involved and passionately interested. No, the goal of philosophy is to be disinterested, to not come to the encounter with your agenda, but with an open, disinterested mind. Being a scholar means being disinterested, objective, able to test alternative theories. And this is akin to Benjamin Friedman, of blessed memories, idea of equipoise in clinical trials. Try not really knowing, right? I'm teaching a class in the election which is all sorts of fun this quarter. And I'm the part of the assignment is that all of my students have to watch an hour of Fox News, of CNN, and of NBS, MSNBC every single week. Because they have to hear, they have to listen, they have to really keep open to the idea that there might be truth where they do not expect to find it. And you have to keep listening. And that's part of what it means to really be a scholar. You have to be aware of error and failure. And that's a part of scholarship too. All of you got that, except for eight of you, got my test wrong. Um, well, can you talk about why? Mistakenness is a part of knowledge. Nuance is a part of knowledge. And the capacity to hold several different moral appeals, different truths at all the same time, that's really critical to scholarship. And remember, you might be wrong. One of my favorite admonitions in the Talmud, um, Babylonian Talmud is there'll be a big debate and then one rabbi will say eh, perhaps the opposite is equally the case and remember that shoe perhaps the opposite is equally the case at the McLean Center one of the things I love the most about our team and the our community of the McLean Center is that capacity within a case discussion to say well what if we looked at it from this side of the family what if we looked at it from this perspective maybe we're wrong here maybe we're getting it wrong and that 
idea of the capacity for error is what scientific experiments are about. So in particular, we turn to the relationship with the other that is so fundamentally a part of our work. And here, of course, because I can't give a talk without referring to Emmanuel Levinas, born assist, as Renata knows, right? When the question is about healthcare, the other comes to you in Levinas's words, naked and vulnerable and unknowable, profoundly unknowable. When they walk into that room, you do not know what where they have been and what's just happened, what's of value to them. And at least two issues are always operative in that clinical encounter. One is, as I've said, the stakes are always of life and death. And for you, it's another day at the office, but for the patient, for the other who comes to you in this vulnerability, it is life and death, right? And is there once a year encounter of mortality and morbidity? And that's an enormous, they're carrying an enormous burden and that's what they're thinking about. Two is you have built your trust based on expertise. As I said, they're not there because they care about your politics. They're there because they care about your expertise in molecular biology or in liver function or injection fraction, some other thing, that's why they're there. And that's the, that's the stakes of the encounter. And that trust on the expertise is fragile and can be destroyed in, in an instant, right? The building of trust based on the primacy of the doctor being only an advocate for each person and not for a system of justice or a telos or a greater good. Now, I care about a system of justice. My books are about systems of justice. I care about the telos. I care about the greater good as a citizen. But if I'm taking care of an individual patient, when I was a nurse and took care of an individual baby, that was the that was the work, that particular body, that in private arena that it's created by the encounter itself. That encounter is about making sure that your only advocacy is for that person, right? And as much as you might be thinking in your hand, my God, this person's using so much resources. So what about the system? What about universal health care? That's not what you're doing there when you're doing medicine, you are for that other and only for that other. And of course, Emmanuel Levinas reminds us of the importance of that. So I wanna say thank you for this talk and for the chance to the chance to do it and to do hardcore philosophy just, just a little bit. Um, of course, to the McLean Center, which has been a lovely community for the last seven years for me. And for faculty colleagues who think with me about liberties and obligations of scholars, online and sometimes in person for Hannah Arendt and the human condition. And any questions? I'll go back to you. So question, did you put 